So welcome everyone to our lecture number 14. We are starting today discussing about the uh, tectonics of our planet. Um, and today's class will be focused on the Earth structure and uh, the next class as well. Um, and today we'll discuss about the seismically defined layers. Yeah, so we'll see what it means this seismically defined. But you know about the core mantle and crust a bit you learned in the general geology class. And here I just wanted to illustrate that uh, this is a, a very beautiful image uh, of our planet from space. And uh, what you can see here, you can see uh, a part of our planet that um, has many, many things, geologically speaking, going on. Uh, you see here the continent of Africa, yeah? So the African continent, the Mediterranean Sea, the Arabian Peninsula. So rifting is going on here yeah, in the Red Sea. This is a new ocean, yeah? So we are talking about the formation of a new oceanic basin here. Um, also here in this image, we are basically following, uh, this is a Black Sea. Uh, so from Europe, there is a huge uh, mountain belt that begins there and we call it the Alps and continues the Carpathians and uh, continues in Iran with the Zagros mountains and in the uh, northern part of the Indian Peninsula with the Himalayas. And the, the, this mountain, bay, uh, mountain uh, range continues into Indochina um, with uh, um, the belts there. So this is the, the big east-west mountain range of our planet. And the other big uh, mountain range of our planet is here in the Americas, going from uh, North America to South America, the Cordillera, American Cordillera and the Andes. So these are features that we will be discussing. And I, I really hope that this is something that you will find exciting because when we go to study geology, actually we come for these things, for under, understanding these things. And the other thing I want to point out, and you'll see why uh, we are talking here about continents, but the blue, yeah, the blue planet, the blue part here, this is the planetary ocean. So what are the oceans, geologically speaking? That's the other question, yeah? So, so bear it with me. Let's start with the structure of our, our planet first. So um, no, nowadays we have some understanding of this structure. And this understanding comes primarily from seismic waves because we cannot go inside our planet. Uh, the deepest drill hole is the Kola super borehole in the Kola Peninsula that was drilled by the uh, Soviet Union, which was the political entity that had Russia as a main country and many other countries that today are more, more or less independent, but officially are independent. And they belonged to this great confederation, yeah, great in terms of uh, uh, extent, called the Soviet Union. And they had the money, they put the money to drill as much as possible. So they reached uh, a bit more than 12 kilometers, which is, which is very little. Yeah. Um, so when we, when we look at, at the layers of, uh, of the planet, we do have the understanding that we have uh, a core and you see we have an inner core and an outer core. And uh, in terms of uh, its uh, state, the state of the matter, it's very interesting that you can see here, it's written liquid. Now you may wonder, how do we know that? Yeah, this is quite a question, yeah? Uh, when you talk about 6,300 kilometers uh, in terms of radius, and we were able to drill only 12, well, how do we know that? Yeah, so we, we, we only drilled through the crust. We never got into the mantle, yeah? So, so um, all these questions, all the information that you see here had to be inferred uh, from, from uh, things that we can measure at the surface. So that's why we use geophysics. We use 
uh, the gravity field, we use the magnetic field, uh, electric methods, but primarily the, uh, the wave phenomena, uh, the waves being created by the earthquakes to probe and get a radiography of the earth. So that's what we know about it. Now, let me tell you a bit about this story. And this, these three <laughs> diagrams might seem to you as very difficult, but they are not. I'm gonna explain to you what they are trying to show. So we are talking here about earthquake waves. So when you have an earthquake, terremotos, yeah, there are waves that are generated. Now waves means propagation of energy. What moves locally, you have the particles that move of the matter, but very locally, the, the particles are not going to travel long distance. They will, they will oscillate, oscillate around the, uh, their point of reference where they normally are, yeah, each, each uh, atom, for instance. So what happens, it's the energy that travels and it, it basically, it uh, activates the, and uh, generates a movement of the particles uh, of solid matter as it travels. And we have two major types of waves, uh, earthquake waves, and uh, we have primary waves, which are the fastest. And we, they are called P waves from primary. And the primary waves, the way they oscillate, so if the wave moves in this direction, the particles will oscillate along this direction. So they will do something like this, yeah? So the particle here of matter will move like this and will impinge on the next particle, which will move like this, and the next particle and so on. And this is how the wave will propagate. Yeah. So this is what happens with the P waves. There is a different type of waves and they are called S waves from secondary waves, but also from shear waves. Now shear waves is because the particles have a shear motion. So the idea is if the waves, a wave travels like this, so the energy travels like this, the particles will move perpendicular to the direction of the propagation of the energy. And that's why they are called shear, yeah? So imagine two little uh, particles here, two uh, atoms here. So one atom moves like this, will pull a bit the other atom, and this will go down and this will go up, and this will pull the other atom. So it moves like this, yeah? That's the idea. So we are talking here about the P waves and the S waves. Now, what happens is the uh, seismologists, when they started uh, recording se seismic waves all around the earth, uh, the earth, they noticed, for instance, what is called a P wave shadow zone. So let's say you have an earthquake on this side of the earth. <laughs> Hello, Mary Ellen. You have an earthquake here. So this is a focus. The focus is the, the place, yeah, the point, where you have a sudden discharge of energy that creates the earthquake. So this energy will travel all acro across the earth, will travel around the surface of the earth as well, with different types of waves that I haven't discussed. But these P waves and S waves will penetrate through the earth and this energy will pro propagate to the other side of the planet. So imagine you have an earthquake here and you have seismological observatories. Yeah, you have seismological observatories, all countries have them. And the seismologists observe that for an earthquake produced here, there is a so-called P wave shadow zone. So if the earthquake is produced here, you see here a 40 degree, a 40 degree angle yeah, here that doesn't receive the P waves. The reason is, and this is how they inferred, that we have a boundary inside the planet. And this is the, the boundary between the mantle and the core. Yeah, a very important boundary. And 
the fact what happens here the waves when they start going through the core the core has a has different physical properties yeah so they have basically uh, different uh, uh, different physical properties means velocity of the waves through the matter there and the density is different so <laughs> no i i don't know what repentance means gutenberg um i i i i'm sorry i don't know that that uh, that name um so <laughs> the idea is that at, the, at this boundary you have the waves some of them will touch it and will continue through the mantle but some of them will go through the core and when they go through the core they get refracted yeah like the light they get refracted so there will be a, an angle change in terms of the direction of the of propagation and because of this angle because of this refraction the wave will not get you know will you will not have continuous coverage in this p wave shadow zone so this is how people learned that we have a boundary a major internal boundary big difference in terms of physical properties so that's why we know that the planet has a core now let's look at the second diagram the second diagram shows you s waves the s waves are shear waves are uh, they they propagate in this direction but the particles oscillate like this what people observed if you have a, an earthquake here you have a huge shadow zone here which actually as you can see this shadow zones shadow zone tells us that the s waves do not go through the core there is only one situation when the s waves cannot propagate through a medium and that is if the medium is liquid because the liquids do not have shear strength if you go into the swimming pool you can move your hand like this in the water without any problem because there is no shear strength you cannot do it like this with a solid yeah so the the, the s waves do not propagate through liquids and that's how we inferred as a scientific community that the outer core is liquid all right so quite interesting information but then it becomes even more complicated because what happens the p waves they go they they do propagate through the liquids they slow down the velocity is slower but they they propagate and then we have a, an inner core which is solid now how do we know about the inner core that it it is solid all we know here is that it's liquid well actually the waves that get some of the energy that gets to the boundary between the outer core and the inner core gets reflected of course you have energy reflected from this boundary and so on but i'm this diagram just points out what is the important piece of information from which we learn these things so you get a, a boundary an interface of reflection and that shows us that we have this inner core yes which is uh, solid actually so in a very simple manner i'm presenting here now seismology and you'll you'll learn a bit of, of seismology with jb i guess or with Indira, uh, you'll, you'll see that seismology is a very complex field in itself. And you'll learn a lot of details about the different waves and you'll do a lot of mathematics. So you better don't forget the mathematics because you need it for the seismology. But just at the first pass, understanding how we know about this structure. So all these seismically defined layers are defined by the fact that 
that we are looking at the propagation of seismic waves at their velocity and that uh, phenomena like refraction and the reflection. And this is how we learn about this. So basically, what I was just showing you in the, our, our diagram, this is what we know. These are the P waves. And you see how the P waves behave in terms, this is a velocity. This should be kilometers per second. It's a, a little typo here, kilometers per second. You see the P waves, how they go. So you go through, they go through the crust, then they enter the mantle. In the mantle, there is a low velocity zone, you see it. And then the velocity increases it up to this transition zone where it increases gradually, you can see it. Now, at this transition zone, we have what's called the boundary between the upper mantle and the lower mantle. And then, then you have the core mantle boundary. Uh, as you can see, it's a sharp decrease in terms of the velocity of the P waves in the liquid core, liquid part of the core. And then we have an increase in the solid part of the core. Whereas the S waves, which kind of parallel in terms of velocity, the behavior of the P waves in the uh, crust and the mantle, you can see that the, the core mantle, uh, mantle boundary, they disappear. Yeah, they disappear here. So the energy doesn't propagate through liquids. Now you, I'm pretty sure that one of you will ask me if they don't propagate through here, <laughs> how come that we have S waves in the inner core? And uh, the, the answer is this, part of the energy that is these P waves at this interface gets converted into an S wave not total the energy, but part of it will get converted into an S wave. And you also have a continuation of the P wave. So this is a part of seismology and you'll learn about it and all the complications and all these things. But as you can see, we have now our understanding about the structure of the earth comes from this field, seismology. Quite interesting actually. So, what I want to show you here, you don't have to read this now, it's for you or to memorize, but I want you to, to realize something. So we, we look at this structure, crust, upper mantle, lower mantle, outer core, inner core, and the whole earth, yeah? So you see the depth, yeah? So 6,371 kilometers, the radius, yeah? If it were a sphere, like an average. Um, and you see, where you have the boundaries. What was the boundary between the upper mantle and the lower mantle, between the lower mantle and the outer core and so on. Here, I'm saying moho, and this is a base of the crust. There is no set uh, depth for the base of the crust. We have a range, we have a range, and you'll see in a bit. So that's why there is no number here. Now this range, of course, will be somewhere between, uh, depending on the type of the crust, but for the continents, you look at things between 30 and 70 kilometers, yeah? In the oceans, much less. Now, when you look at the volume, and it's interesting to look at the, at the volume in terms of percentage, yeah? How much of the Earth's volume is in each layer? And you see how little is in the crust, yeah? And you see how much is in the mantle, for instance. And when you look at the mass, at the mass, you see that the, the outer core has a lot of mass here. Of course, most of the mass is in the mantle. You can see it here. And when it comes to densities, yeah, we talk about densities. So you see 2.6, 2.9, the average densities of the rocks forming the crust. But when we talk about the core, look at the densities here. So it's even hard to imagine yeah? <laughs> um, how dense uh, the matter is there. Of course, uh, gold is very dense, yeah? So uh, it's not that you don't know material so dense, that is gold. 
All right, so, so far, we looked at the seismically defined layers. So here we talk about crust, we talk about the mantle, which is divided into the upper mantle with the transition zone, the lower mantle, the outer core, and the inner core. Here, there is a little complication because here you see, you see the crust, and then you see something that's called lithospheric mantle, and you see lithosphere and asthenosphere. So you may wonder, what is this about? I mean, I haven't mentioned anything about this. And we'll talk about this uh, on Thursday uh, in the next class, because uh, this is the rheological layering of the earth. So that, that refers to the rheological behavior. But until then, until we discuss about the lithosphere and the asthenosphere, we are talking about these seismically defined layers. So let's go briefly through them. What we'll do, we'll discuss a bit about the core, a bit about the mantle, and then we'll start discussing about the crust. Now, when we discuss about the crust, you'll see some interesting things. That's the layer we know most about because we have access to the rocks of the crust and all these things. Um, but generally, for you to have an idea, you see, when we talk about the core, you see what the radius of the core is. We already talked about the fact that uh, it has two layers, the liquid and the solid one. And it is considered that it, it is composed of iron and nickel. Yeah. Iron and nickel, some minor elements uh, as well. Um, we already discussed that the velocity, the seismic uh, velocity and density have sharp changes, sharp changes at the boundary between the outer and inner core. Yeah, the radius is this there. Now, this is interesting. The inner core, it's anisotropic in both velocity and attenuation. What it means, it means that the velocity and attenuation of the seismic waves depends on the direction. Yeah. So as you can see, if the direction is along polar paths, so from one pole to the other, imagine that you draw a line, yeah, the velocity, but also the attenuation of the waves is higher along these paths, uh, as opposed to the equi equi equatorial paths. So what happens, you have something very interesting in this uh, inner core, uh, the properties depend on the direction of propagation. It is believed that this anisotropy is caused by the fact that you have crystals, iron crystals, that are that have a preferential alignment, so that this preferential alignment allows for the waves to propagate faster in one direction and uh, slower in a perpendicular direction. Yeah, that's the idea. Now, when we talk about the outer core, which is which is uh, liquid, this doesn't have an isotropy. It has it's homogeneous. Um, it, and the most interesting part about the outer core, it is that we, as a scientific community, think that the Earth's magnetic field is generated by currents that flow, yeah, by by the movement, the convective movement uh, of this iron nickel alloy, which generates the magnetic field. Now, there are people, physicists, who try to model the magnetic field. You know, the magnetic field, when you will take the, the um, uh, geophysics course, we will discuss about the magnetic field and the fact that the magnetic field is not uh, fixed. Yeah, it varies, yeah, it changes. And these changes reflect these movements, this convec uh, convection that occurs in the outer core. But there are physicists who study this and uh, try to model, and it's extremely complex and not completely understood. There is a part of the magnetic field that it's very difficult to model in and predict. All right, so this, so much about core, it's basically a domain of physicists basically because they they all they can 
used to learn about the core are physical fields. When you talk about the mantle, of course, there will be again physicists involved in talking about these proper uh, physical properties. But here, when we talk about the mantle, geochemists start to be involved because the, the mantle is a reservoir of elements from which we had the separation of crust. Yeah, it is like the crust. Yeah, it, it, we have a differentiation that happened uh, in geologic time and elements from the mantle were basically accumulated in the crust. So it is very uh, important and interesting from a geochemical point of view. So the top of the mantle, so the base of the crust, the moth, yeah, it, as you see between seven and seven would be in the oceans, not in the case of the continents, but seven to 70 kilometers. And that's why it says depends on the location, whereas the base of the mantle is at the depth of 2,000 and 900 uh, kilometers. And here is most of the Earth's mass, mass. You see the layers that it is divided into um, <clears throat> uh, the mantle, I, considering the transition zone. Some people would say that the upper mantle includes the transition zone and we have the upper mantle and lower mantle, and especially the geochemists will discuss about the upper mantle and the lower mantle, yeah? Uh, people like seismologists might say, well, the upper mantle up to the transition zone, the transition zone, and the lower mantle. Doesn't matter, as long as we understand that we have these discontinuities. In terms of chemical composition, it is considered that it is more or less uniform, that the, the dominant mineral is the mineral with, uh, with the composition of olivine, which you see here is the formula of this mineral. But of course, it undergoes phase transition, so reorganization uh, of the uh, crystal structure into denser forms as, as you get deeper, yeah? So that, that it, that's what it means, phase transition. So these are polymorphs. So the composition of olivine is considered to be the dominant composition in the mantle. But it, 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 the actual, structure, crystalline structure, gets packed uh, denser, yeah, at this, um, at, at these depths, yeah, so that, that's where you have these transitions. Now, there is a, a, a big debate in the geoscience community, and uh, this is a field of geodynamics, and you will study geodynamics as well, about the convection in the mantle. So when we talk about convection, that means that something flows. And the question is what flows? And of course, there is solid matter, but we, we learned about the rocks that flow. That's why we learned in, in the part of structural geology. Yeah? So uh, the idea is that over geologic time, it is considered that you have convection in the mantle. And the convection, there is a big argument on whether the convection, you have two layers of convection, one in the upper mantle and one in the lower mantle, or you have big convection cells that occur through the whole mantle. And various phenomena uh, also are associated uh, with the movement of mantle material. For instance, you can have, um, uh, you, you can have uh, mantle plumes like the rise of very hot uh, material from the base of the mantle to the top. And there are geoscientists who argue that during the, the history of the earth, we had manifestation of volcanism related to mantle plumes. And there are geoscientists that uh, negate, deny the existence of mantle plumes. So another um, point of uh, debate. So, that's what I'm trying to, um, no, here I'm trying to say actually that there is also a, a debate on the convection and the convection is important not only mechanically, but also geochemically because the geochemists argue how the transfer of elements from the mantle into the crust happens and has been happening. 
So this is another um, domain that may be of interest to some of you if you want to go and, uh, and uh, become specialized in uh, uh, various aspects of the mantle. The only drawback to both the core and mantle and that you will never have access to them. You will never have access to physically see what is there. You have to infer indirectly from physical fields and from um, geochemistry, from various isotopes that we understand that they come from the mantle and they are in the rocks that we can access. All right, so this, uh, this slide, I'm not going to read it. It's for you to uh, uh, read the text here. Uh, it just discusses, uh, discusses a bit um, the upper mantle. Yeah. Um, it says that the upper mantle has a low velocity zone and we'll see what, what happens with this velocity zone uh, next, uh, next time in the next class. But low velocity means low velocity of the seismic wave. So there is a slowdown. Yeah? The, the reason uh, being the possibility of partial melting of the material there, partial melting. So the presence of some fluid phase um, leads to the decrease in the velocity. The transition zone, I already mentioned it, and the lower map. So, Let's start talking now. Uh, this was the introduction to the structure of the planet, <laughs> core and mantle. We'll hear about the mantle in the context of the lithosphere. And I'm telling you from now, one of the things I want you to know very clearly will be the difference between the crust and the lithosphere. This is very important. So, but for the rest of the class and for the most of your um activities in geoscience you will deal with the crust so we will focus on the crust this is the part that we have most access to yeah. um, and it's very interesting it's very interesting what happens on our planet we have two fundamentally different types of crust on earth and one is called the continental crust it, it forms about 30 percent of the earth surface and corresponds largely to the continents that are exposed, that are not submerged. And the oceanic crust, which covers the remaining 70%. You see them here, yeah, uh, depicted here. So this would be the oceanic crust, and this would be continental crust. They are very different in terms of composition and in terms of thickness. So you might become a geoscientist specialized uh in continental geology so you will know a lot about continental crust or some people go and study oceanic geology yeah? they, and they specialize in the uh oceanic crust and they then they know more about the oceanic crust and so on um <clears throat> so david uh, can you ask me again because I couldn't see and I would have to stop this to to see. Uh, Sir, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I'm talking about uh, I have the understanding that the fossil as Marianas. I don't know the name in English. Uh, yes. Marianas something. Trench. I Trench. Marianas Trench, right? Is the deepest uh, natural uh, point in in the in the earth earth structure, right? Yes. But is that part of the crust or are we talking that there is also a mantle or right oh right okay so <laughs> um you see here some words yeah and you see the word trench here um the trench uh depicts uh, what in uh, espanol would be fossa mm -hmm. so it is a, a topographic term in a sense uh because we talk about these trenches as the deepest points in the oceans uh but of course they have a geologic significance um just to answer first david's question uh what we call the trench it is still the top of the ocean it's the bottom of the ocean yeah so the top of the oceanic crust it, it just happens that topographically it's basically 
a trench, a fossa. Yeah, so what happens, they mark the points where we have a process that's called subduction, where the oceanic crust basically sinks uh, under another plate, which could be, uh, could have continental crust or oceanic crust, doesn't matter. So that's why you have these trenches, but it's still oceanic crust here. So what you, you see de depicted here is only crust with this darker shade this would be the oceanic crust. So this would be the Moho, the Mohorovicic discontinuity would be the base of the oceanic uh, crust. And the Mohorovicic discontinuity under the continents would be here, yeah? Now you see, we have some topographic terms, but also they have geologic significance. So that's why the trench refers to the topography, but has geologic significance. The significance, sea mount, you see, it's like a little mountain, yeah, on the bottom of the ocean. Of course, they are built by volcanism um, on the bottom of the ocean. And sometimes um, you have huge edifices, like the largest, basically, volcanoes, uh, largest volcanic edifices on Earth are these sea mounts that grew and grew and grew. And the island of Hawaii is the biggest, yeah, because it has a, um, it extends for nine kilometers from the bottom of the ocean to the top above the ocean. And um, <clears throat> you see a mid ocean ridge and uh, another topographic name called abyssal plain, yeah. So this is basically most of the surface of the ocean. So this is a top of the oceanic crust. And then you have the transition to the continents and you can see it with the continental rise. So, and the continental shelf. <clears throat> so the continental shelf would be the extension of the continent under the surface of the sea. <clears throat> and the continental rise is where the continent ends. Yeah, so you can see it here. And then when you talk about continental geology, of course, we'll discuss about the uh, mountain ranges and the, the actual parts uh, uh, like continental platforms. We'll learn today what they are. All right, so you can see that um, I'm saying here the proportions of the two types of crust can be seen on a graph called the hypsometric curve. I'm gonna show it to you uh, immediately. Um, what you'll see is that most continental crust, most continental crust, is between the sea level and one kilometer above the sea level, whereas most oceanic crust lies between three and five kilometers below sea level. Yeah, so this would be the abyssal plains here. So let's let's look at the hypsographic, uh, hypsometric uh, curve. <clears throat> so what happens, I, I'll, I'll explain to you what we have here. This is a cumulative graph. So from percentage, yeah, this is percentage from zero to 100. So zero means 0% zero of the Earth's surface. 100 means 100% 100 of the Earth's surface. So as we, and, and here is the height. So let's say we start with the highest mountain, which, you know, it's Everest. <laughs> so with the highest mountain, yeah. So how much of uh, you know, of surface uh, from at 8.5 kilometers, how much we have. You see, it's very little, yeah, it's only this. But let's say how much of surface we have, um, here would probably be, uh, I don't know, uh, he, this is probably one kilometer. Yeah, this is five, this is one kilometer. So the idea is how much of the surface we, ha we have above one kilometer, yeah? So you can go here and say, well, we have above one kilometer, we have this, let's say 15%. So 15% of the surface is above one kilometer. Bogota is here, yeah? Uh, how much is between zero and one kilometer? And you calculate from here, yeah? So that's the idea of the hypsometric curve. 
So as you can see, you can see that a lot of, uh, of the surface is submerged, is under the sea level. So 70%. But that doesn't mean that 70%, you see 70% here on this uh, graph, it includes part of the continental crust here because the continents have to end, yeah? Uh, so up to from zero to, I see 43, let's say here, yeah? It would be more or less continents. Uh, and more than half, it, it would be oceans on this curve. So um, if, if you look at the deepest uh, point in the ocean, what David mentioned, the Mariana Trench, yeah? Uh, more or less 11 kilometers depth. Yeah, it's here, very little. Very, very little surface is in the trenches. So this is what it shows to you. And I think this is a very interesting, a very, very interesting uh, graph that you can study. Uh, it is taken from textbook, so you can uh, see it better if you want in the textbook. Now, let me show you something interesting as well. This is, uh, I, I would say this will be a bit mind blown. All right, so <laughs> these are histograms. Now, the histogram, yeah, um, will show you, will show you the distribution of elevation, yeah? And you see elevation in increments of, uh, of one kilometer. So, and these are histogram. So if you look on, on the earth, yeah, how much, uh, how much of the earth is uh, at eight kilometers? How much is at seven? How much is at six and so on? Yeah, so this is what the histogram shows. If you compare the Earth, the Mars and the Moon and, and uh, Venus, yeah, if you look at this, you'll see that there is something unique, unique about the Earth. And the unique part that I'm pointing out is that it is a bimodal distribution. It has two peaks, yeah. So it has a peak that corresponds, you see, to the elevation here. Yeah, it, uh, uh, this is a mean. This is not the sea level, it is a mean. So uh, statistically speaking, uh, it is between the, the two extremes, yeah, the mean. So you have one peak here, sea level is here, you see. But the sea level means where the water is. We don't talk about the water. We talk about the distribution uh, of the surface. So you have one peak here and one peak here. You don't have these peaks on these plants. So there is something, something different on the earth than on these plants, than on Mars, than on Venus, than on moon. And the question is, what is it really different? And what, what is different is that we have this bimodal distribution. We have some part of the surface is a, you know, kind of high and some part of the surface is kind of low. Yeah, that's what it is. And um, this reflects something of geologic significance. There is something on our planet that, that makes it be like this, the surface, as opposed to the our plants. Yeah, and this is why we discuss this in tectonics, and that's why we'll discuss ab about the uh, plate tectonics and all these things. Yeah, but what it reflects, it reflects the two different types of crust: the oceanic crust and the continental crust. And we don't have oceanic crust and continental crust on Mars, on Venus, on Moon. This, this distinction. These different compositions, yeah, in these types of crust. So I think this is very interesting, and this should give you, uh, you know, a reason to think about it and think, well, why is it like this? What happens to our planet to make it like this? Quite interesting. So here are the differences, yeah, the differences. So when you talk about the composition, uh, you haven't taken yet the petrology course with Marcus, but petrology, of course, is very important. And 
when we talk about composition, we can say that the continental crust is less mafic. Less mafic, mafic comes uh, from magnesium and ferrum, iron, yeah? So it has less uh, ferromagnesian minerals, yeah? When you talk about the rocks, there are the rocks that have more like felsic minerals like quartz and plagioclase and rocks that have mafic minerals like olivine, pyroxenes, amphiboles. Uh, so the composition of, of the continental crust has less of these minerals. More such minerals are in the basalts and the gabbros of the oceanic crust. So, of course, this will lead to different uh, different uh, physical properties like density. So the the continental crust will be less dense than the oceanic crust. Now, the mode of formation and mode of formation means okay. Here we are talking about tectonics. Yeah, when we talk about the continental crust, it's a mixture of various things. Yeah, we we have rocks that formed. In volcanic arcs or hotspots, yeah, for instance, and then some rocks that were transformed through mountain building and sedimentary rocks through the erosion and sedimentation. So we have all these uh, variations. Uh, whereas the oceanic crust is more uniform; it forms at the mid-ocean ridges, yeah, and you have the process of seafloor spraying. We'll discuss about this, but it is more uniform uh, in terms of thickness. You've seen that the, uh, the continental crust is thick between 25 to 70 kilometers, ocean crust, crust between six and 10. In terms of, I already mentioned heterogeneity, the uh, continental crust is very heterogeneous, very heterogeneous, um, as opposed to the ocean crust. In terms of age, and this is very interesting, in terms of age, the continental crust has the oldest rocks, which go down to 4.1 billion years. The oceanic crust, because it gets subducted, it's not older than about 200 million years. So again, a big difference, a big difference here. And when it comes to the base, to the base of the crust, in the case of um, of the oceans, it, it is oceanic crust. Um, you have a sharp boundary. The continental uh, boundary in is, is more diffuse and so on. It's, uh, the continental crust is really, really challenging. It has this history of deformation, of formation, and so on. So very interesting, actually. So a bit about the oceanic crust. The oceanic crust, crust has a structure and it, it, it tends to be more or less the same. Um, it has these layers that you can see. So what happens from the bottom of the sea, which we call the seafloor. We, you see this layer like sediment. Of course, you'll have sediment. There is sediment depending how close you are to uh, it is to the uh, continent will be detrital sediment that comes from the continents. The farther you are from the continent, it is finer and finer, yeah, because the larger grains cannot be transported. And it also has a sediment of uh, biological nature. The organisms and the, uh, the microorganisms that
un momento. I am going to restart. See if there is anything. Can you hear me now? Or see me? Yeah, teacher. Yes. Okay, good. Sorry for this. Sometimes it happens. Uh, I don't know why. Might be that um, that there is a failure in the signal here. I'm gonna restart here. Okay, and go here. One more. All right. If you don't hear me, let me know. Okay. So what happens is that. We have these layers, as you can see, but the um, let's see what what I say here. The distinct layers, you see, um, we have the layer of sediment here. We have a layer of basalt, which is called pillow basalt, because when the basalt, the lava extrudes uh, on the sea bottom, it forms the top of the of the basalt is like a pillow. Yeah, it takes this rounded shape. That's why it's called pillow basalt. And then uh, you have this layer called gabbro, which is the same composition, but coarse grain. You can see, you can see the, the mineral crystals. Uh, there are also dikes, uh, basaltic dikes that intrude this complex as well. Um, and at the bottom is something that's called cumulate. And uh, this is, uh, a mafic rock, it's more as a mafic rock uh, with mag uh, ferromagnesian uh, minerals. All right, so this would be the layering, the layering of the oceanic crust. Uh, and below the mo moho is the mantle, and the mantle is ultra mafic. That means it's a rock called peridotite, which is basically olivine with pyroxenes, yeah? whereas uh, the gabbro and the cumulate would, would have plagioclase as well. All right, so this is the oceanic crust. I'm not gonna insist too much now on the oceanic crust um, because we have to discuss about the continental crust, which is much more complex. <laughs> and this will take us more time. Uh, not today, we will not uh, finish today the discussion on the continental crust. Uh, just three more slides, I think, and we'll be done. So I want you to look here at the uh, what's called the global averages of different types of continental crust. You see here is an orogen, and it shows you that it's thicker. So where you have belts like the Andes, that's where you have the thickest continental crust. And then there is something called shields and platforms, and I'll show you what they are, uh, a bit less thick. And uh, then you have continental arcs or uh, regions of extended crust. We'll discuss about extended crust. We'll discuss about continental arcs, about all these things. So do not worry about what each of these are. What you can see is that where you have extended crust, so you extend things, they thin, yeah, they get thinner. So it's the same with the crust. The crust gets ex extended, yeah, pulled, it gets thinner. If the crust in an origin is compressed, it gets thicker. So it's intuitive, it makes sense. And in between, in between these two extremes, we have transitions. All right, so I think this is uh, quite uh, easy to, 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 to see. Um, as I mentioned, it is less mafic, yeah? So it has a silicic to intermediate composition. It's the same equivalent in terms of rocks, granite to granite diorite. Uh, the granite would have typically quartz, feldspar. Some mafic minerals could be mica, uh, biotite could be an amphibole, uh, but dominantly quartz and uh, plagioclase. That's what it would have. The, the, Granite would have more quartz, 
uh, than a ground direct, for instance. All right, so the crust, it is very, very uh, heterogeneous, yeah? So you will learn in petrology about a lot of rocks, but it, there is a very logical, um, how to put it, a very logical um, classification that you will learn as well. And um, also think about the fact that it has a, hu a long tectonic history, a history of deformation. So faulting, folding, intrusions, all these things are part of what we have to understand. Now, let's look at this. Uh, these layers are basically seismically defined. Again, they show different velocities of the seismic waves. So as you can see, as you go deeper from the upper crust to the lower crust, the velocity of the seismic waves increases. Yeah, you, you can see that. Now, at the base of the crust where there is a moho, there is a jump. Typically, there is a jump from this interval to more than eight kilometers per second. Yeah, that's uh, typically the jump in terms of the velocity, which reflects a change in petrology and the change in the physical properties. All right, so we will start now for the next five minutes. I'll show you something interesting uh, until we finish the class. Um, the categories of continental crust. So we talk about cratons, which means shields and continental platforms. You see here shields and platforms. You see it here. We'll talk about phanerozoic origins. Phanerozoic is an eon that started 570 million years ago. <laughs> the Earth is 4.5 billion years. Yeah, so only a little part is Phanerozoic. And most of the geological schools, they teach Phanerozoic geology. But that's a very little part of the Earth's history. We'll talk about rifts and passive margins. But today, let's look at the cratons. So this might be something that surprises you. <laughs> well, what I'm showing you here, I'm showing the regions of continental crust that are of Precambrian age. That means rocks older than 570 million years. So we in the red are the rocks that are exposed, that you know they crop out a florimanto at the surface. In green are the rocks that are covered by younger Phanerozoic sedimentary layers, but the the um, basement to these layers is Precambrian. It's just that you had water at some point over this old continent that deposited sedimentary layers on top of it. But actually the basement is Precambrian. So as you can see, the vast majority of the continents is very old. So huge tracts of the continents are part of the Precambrian geology. And in the geological schools, they teach Phanerozoic geology. What is that? Yeah. So. That's why I, I want to give you a balanced view. The red parts that are exposed are called shields. Shields. Uh, Solo, Himalayas and Andes, uh, sorry, David, I, I missed it. Can you talk? I, I don't mind if you talk, if you talk. <laughs> sorry, teacher. So uh, looking into the map, Los Himalayas and Los Andes will be relatively new Origins, yes, or something like that. Yes, or they are young origins. Yes, they are young origins. The Andes and the Himalayas. Yes, so they, uh, you 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 saw it nicely. The Andes, the uh, American Cordillera here, and the Alps and the Himalayas. Here they are young origins, and you see the Himalayan um, mountain range extending into into China here. Um, and Africa. There and Africa is a crater. Like Africa, Africa is a crater. It has the Atlas Mountains here, but uh, other than that, not much. 
Yeah, it okay. is a big craton. <laughs> yes. Okay. Thank you. So, no problem. So, the idea is that the oldest part of the continents, which are the nuclei of the continents, yeah, they are called cratons. These are the stable parts of the continents. Uh, in the last billion years, we call craton what is older than one billion year. So in the uh, last one billion years, they were stable. They were not uh, significantly deformed or metamorphosed. Everything happened before. Parts of them were buried by these sedimentary layers. So we call, you, you imagine the craton, yeah? And the craton, part of it is exposed and we call that Precambrian shields, yeah? So the, the rocks, the Precambrian rocks are exposed. So if you look at, at Africa, you see a lot of regions here where the Precambrian rocks are exposed. Uh, also, this is the Canadian shield, very famous. I'll talk about the Guyana shield in a bit. So these are rocks that are igneous and metamorphic. Yeah, metamorphic because uh, some of these rocks, uh, initial pre-existing rocks suffered deformation and transformation and they metamorphosed. And parts of these continental areas in the past were covered by water and sedimentary rocks were formed there, sediments were deposed uh, and then you have these sedimentary layers on parts of this, and these form the continental platforms or and intracratonic basins. Yeah. So the continental platforms are in general less than two kilometer thick. The intracratonic basins, they there may have been a rifting, for instance. They could be five to seven kilometers thick. Yeah. So when you talk about this, they, if you go to Western Canada to Alberta. This is called the Western Canada sedimentary basin. Very famous for oil. But the basement is Precambrian, is part of the North American craton. That's the idea. So in this case, you talk about the basement and you talk about the cover. And the cover is the, the, the package of sedimentary rocks that are phanerozoic. And finally, I don't want to keep you uh, beyond the, the time that we have allocated. Just to give you an example, I will later in the course, when we talk about Precambrian geology, I'll, I'll show you about the North American continent because it's better known, better understood. But the challenge for you is to understand this better, the South American Precambrian geology because it's not that well understood and it for sure it contains many surprises and a lot of wealth in terms of mineral wealth, like all the cratons. Africa is very rich in, in uh, uh, minerals, very rich. And uh, that's why it's such a, a, a place where various countries try to go and get, you know, the resources from Africa taking advantage of the, of the poor political situations and all these things. So just to illustrate with something from uh, South America, we talk about the Amazon Craton. Now you see the Amazon Craton here as it extends. Yeah? There are other Precambrian Cratons here like uh, Rio de la Plata Craton here, for instance. But the Amazon Craton is the largest and it is all Precambrian and you see how it extends. So you see here Colombia, you see it very nicely. Now what happens to illustrate the shield areas are these ones that you see in color and you see the ages for the different provinces. The oldest one is this Carajas one, yeah? This is the oldest one you see from three to 2.5 billion years old. So our Kian age. And maybe this one is Archean age here. And what happens, these are the shield areas. So this is a Guyana shield, very famous Guyana shield. And here you have the areas of continental platforms or intracratonic basins. Yeah? 
For instance, this uh, AM is the Amazonas basin. L here means Janos, yeah, the Janos in Colombia. So imagine about this, picture yourself as a geoscientist in your career, you can go to the Janos and explore the basement to the platform here, yeah, the basement, and try to see what kind of rocks you have there and if they have any mineral wealth, you might find gold deposits under the sedimentary rocks. So that's why I'm saying it is not that well known in South America. And it, this is the challenge for the future. In North America, it is better known. That doesn't mean that we know everything. It is very challenging there as well. I'm gonna show you uh, in this course. So remember, these areas that are exposed are the shield areas and the areas that are covered by Phanerozoic age sedimentary rocks and no Proterozoic, so which is less than one billion year old. What is less than one billion years old? Uh, these are the platforms, continental platforms and intracratonic basins. Yeah, so you can read this, uh, this legend to see the, the various names of the provinces, the geologic provinces and so on. So this being said, uh, please read uh, in more detail what we discussed in this, uh, in this class. If you have questions, as you know, more than welcome to answer them if I know the answer. <laughs> so if not, uh, Feliz tarde a todos y nos vemos uh, jueves. Thank you, teacher. Oh, you are very welcome, Gabriel. <laughs> Bye, teacher. Thank you. Bye, David. Bye. You're welcome. Thank you, Valentina. Thank you, Juan.